Okay, I'll log in. I'll Welcome everyone. I wanted to call this webinar, Finding a Healthy and Powerful Voice. So I wanna welcome everyone as we begin a discussion of vocal health and longevity for professional voice users. So as humans, we want and need to have our voices heard. Some of us will write, paint, write poetry or novels. Some of us use our voices to perform, actors, singers, to teach or to sing, or in communications. I talk in my vocal pedagogy classes and say, long ago there was something that used to hang on the wall and it was called a telephone. And it would ring and you would pick it up and answer it and say hello. And someone was on the other end of the line and they might say, hi, what's wrong? So it's so interesting because in our voices, our life is reflected and we each sound unique in that way. And that's what we say is our vocal fingerprint. So I love this picture by Schmitz. I tell my students learning the techniques of singing is really, really a journey and not a race. It takes a lot of patience takes a lot of skill. And I show this to my voice students each year and say, this is the goal. So while you're learning, you're gonna break a lot of plates, but the goal is to get to the skills and refine the skills over and over so that eventually you can keep all the plates in the air. And then comes the joy when you're secure enough to just let go. And it's a kind of, um, idea that we also were happy to talk about in school today, riding a bike. We start out on a big wheel or a tricycle, and then we get a bike with training wheels. So we have a little bit of disequilibrium and our parents take the training wheels off. And more often than not, they run behind us holding onto the bike until we feel that we've got the balance set and then we're ready to go. And I use this analogy because there's a lot of people that need to keep their balance when it comes to their speaking voice. And those are people who are also, besides singers, very interested and concerned about vocal health and longevity. So who might these people be? Who might a professional voice user be? These are people who depend on strength and stamina to do their jobs successfully, and most importantly, with longevity. So that can include classical and musical theater singers, actors, teachers in public school and in academia, sports coaches, customer service representatives who are on calls or Zoom, lawyers, clergy, people who sing and act as an avocation in addition to uh, being the people that use their voice in a professional way. So this group of people that I've listed here are also the people that have to learn how to keep all the playing plates in the air. They need to learn the skills. So we're kind of a vocal athlete with good training, we also can get strength, but also be susceptible to injury. There could be other health conditions that could challenge vocal health, but we don't have the time to get into all those things now. I think what the most important thing to do would be to say, what does a professional voice user need to be informed about? Well, their instrument, which basically is their voice. So, Let's begin and try to think in a way that a lot of us begin our journeys singing in choirs, uh, in churches and schools, but compared to other instruments, a lot of times young singers often sing on talent alone. So the information we've got to learn about how our instrument works and how to manage it technically will help us move towards success. So these are some of the things that we need to investigate. The structure of the larynx, or people refer to it as the voice box, but it is our larynx, and how to create voice 
and how to care for the voice, body mapping, and releasing both physical and psychological stressors that get in the way of us being efficient. Respiration, so the importance of breathing for singing and speaking. And another thing that I think is really, really important for us is how to practice and how to warm up our voice to get ready for the day. So our larynx is where sound is generated. And it's about two inches in length and it houses our vocal folds or our vocal cords. And our brain sets up the whole system. Our lungs provide the air energy. I, like, I liken it in a way of a hairdress, a hairdryer and a ping pong ball. And you kind of keep the air moving and supporting the voice in that way as the ball releases. Um, our muscular system helps support our sound and help sustain our sound. Now that's a really very, very simplistic view, but it may be a helpful one to understand for other professions besides those of us that sing and actors that speak and work in the theater, uh, because a lot of jobs, well, involve a lot of conversation. So as I said before, our brain provides a signal to us for movement. So when we talk of a body map, we mean looking at how our bodies support us and how body tensions can sometimes get in the way. Healthcare workers use a body map to look at the overall health and how systems are working. But we as singers and performers and teachers look at a body map as learning how our bodies release or hold certain tensions because this can lead to injury. So tensions are not addressed carefully enough in a day-to-day -day or without the guidance of a teacher or speech and voice therapist don't really allow for efficiency and an optimum kind of release. And that can really impact us. So we can't deliver a healthy message, right? So here are some possible places that in this body map we need to be aware of. So even just sitting here, we can check our own bodies for where do you hold the tension? So I always ask this in a class and I see the hands go up. Sometimes I see the hands go up for every one of these, right? But it's really good personally to narrow down what's really helpful. Suppose we hear it in the, feel it in the neck, we feel it in the shoulders, the jaw, maybe in our lower back as it radiates. Sometimes hands and wrists can be held tightly or our hips are locked or our knees are locked or ankles. So it's really not often just one place, but many places. And there's some terrific disciplines that can help us release as we prepare to have a day of talking or teaching or coaching or preparing sermons and preparing talking. And so vulnerable are our teacher, singer, performers who are teaching public schools all day and then want to do their own performing. So we study yoga, we study Alexander technique, we study uh, stretches and working with our physical therapists to help us remediate where we feel the tension getting in the way of the ideal. Well, I also mentioned breath in the first slide. So I love this slide because it's a credo that one of my voice teachers wrote about in his book. And anyone that sings in a church choir will appreciate the message here. In the beginning, there was breath and singing was with breath and singing was breath, and singing was breath. And all singing was made by the breath, and without breath was not any singing made that was made. So it's a little convoluted, but I think I'm probably seeing uh, some laughters from maybe some of our choral conductors out there. Um, yeah, it's immensely important because as professional voice users, we think about positioning the voice, and we always think about managing our breath. That's the key to healthy singing and speaking. Voice teachers and voice therapists work with their students on managing this. And I would imagine in every voice lesson and in every session, 
they're talking about breath management and breath energy because it supports the dynamics, whether our voice is louder or more quiet, the control that we have, singing in the ease of legato and the ease of the vocal mechanism and the singing mechanism itself. So what's helped support this whole system that we see for breathing? The most important thing is the thoracic cage that we see. And we see those intercostal muscles. Those are the muscles between the ribs that help us support our sound. They allow the ribs to expand. They allow the ribs to contract. We don't really think much about this when we speak, but when we need to engage these muscles to help us support the sound, and when we sing and when we speak in lecture two, they're really, really important. So just as a little example, to put your arms gently on the sides where we see those intercostal muscles and breathe in, one, two, three, four, sustain, or hold slightly, and then release the breath, one, two, three, four. That cycle of breathing and that way the muscles support is very, very critical for singers to learn and maintain and to uh, make progress with as they go through their college years into the professional singing life. So our larynx generates our voice as we talked about before. So air coming from the trachea or our windpipe through the glottis in the larynx where the vocal folds are located generates our voice. And this is how the journey begins. So how do we make voice? How are we making voice in that way? Using these ligaments and muscles, and they're so finely tuned, small muscles within the laryngeal structure. Our vocal folds can be open, closed, and tense, brought together closely. It looks like a curtain maybe being open or closed. So when we breathe out or we exhale, the air will fall through a gap between the vocal folds, called the glottis, and depending on their exact position, it will make the vocal folds vibrate in different ways, resulting in, well, different tones and sounds. So intrinsic muscles, those muscles in our larynx are very, very sophisticated, and they adjust also for raising the pitch or lowering the pitch. And then together, with the movements of our tongue and mouth, very different sounds can be produced at different values. It allows us to speak and sing really clearly in our own language or other languages. And we call this adjusting the vocal tract, vocal mechanism for the optimal release of the sound. That is the absolute goal for us. So that in a way we feel no tension here and it's very, very easy. So if some of you have wondered how people can be in an opera or a play and sing for one, two, almost three hours from time to time, it's this intense training that allows that to be done healthily. And this is a picture of what our vocal folds look like. We can look from the top in that way. In the front, we see the epiglottis. And we see on the right side, the opening and closing of those pristine, beautiful vocal folds in sort of an easy wave against each other when things are doing uh, or working for us in exactly the way that we want them to. So that was a very, very quick outline of how the mechanism works. And there's lots of terrific videos and books that describe this in detail. And I think what's really important to remember is, well, practice doesn't always make perfect, but practice makes progress. And to hold ourselves up to making progress, whether we're going through therapeutic work with our speech and voice pathologists, or therapeutic singing work with our singing teachers and coaches and people helping us position our voices healthily, it's really, really important to be patient. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do these days. So I wanted to show this picture because it's a picture of um, when I went to Rome long ago. So the word that I'm talking about is chiaroscuro meaning the clear, the bright, and the dark, those qualities. And 
by working on vocal exercises and preparing for a long, long day of singing or teaching, voice professionals have to become like athletes. And for me, this wonderful word, finding the dark and the light, makes our voices resonant and well positioned and interesting to listen to. So like the colors that go into a paint can or on a beautiful Rembrandt painting, right? Why is there a little green and red in my black, right? Why, why is yellow coming into this painting when I see the light? Our voices and the voices we love to listen to have these colors. We all have favorite singers that we love to listen to. And so by having a well-modulated voice, our message gets to the listeners with greater strength versus one that is pressed or pushed or hard to listen to or unsupported, which is basically one that's absolutely less healthy. And as we age, our mechanism ages too. The, um, the cartilage we have in our knee is just like the cartilage that makes up our laryngeal mechanism. So older singers and speakers need to be conscious that they will need more support also. And the first step of helping yourself is to find a plan for really, really good vocal hygiene for both the teachers and their students. And teachers, you have to give your students this information. So reminding us uh, is a great plan that reminds us that long days of teaching need extra special care in that way. So I wanna to move to a slide that talks a little bit about how we can think about vocal hygiene because prevention to, to support our voice is so much more important. So we've got to drink water about six to eight glasses per day. Sometimes that's hard. I see most of my kids here at Eastman, my singers and the singers in our voice and opera department, they are always carrying around a big bottle of water. So we've at least gotten that message, I think really clear to them. Provide time in the day to vocally rest. I mean, really rest. So I used to say, I hate texting. Um, I hate emails. I would much rather uh, talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, but truth be told, times for vocal rest are really, really important. We want to use those times to be absolutely quiet and have that time to recuperate in that way. Maybe after a long day of church services and singing or sermons, and sometimes our clergy are giving given two sermons per day, uh, especially during these holiday periods. It's a big important week for most of our uh, clergy rabbis and everybody who is involved in services. We wanna avoid excessive use of diuretics, which can be caffeine and alcohol. So if you're drinking some wine, you're also drinking some water, right? Using breath energy to support our speaking voice is just as important as if you were an actor or a singer. And I'll talk a little bit about that more towards the end of this presentation. Avoid talking in really noisy restaurants. Well, we know as people begin to have more fun in a restaurant, um, the noise increases and the Lombard effect means that as the noise increases, we're talking louder over the table to the person there so that they can hear us. And sometimes that can be very, very uh, stressful for our uh, throats and our vocal folds. Create a really good exercise program. Cardio is really important. Swimming is great, especially for people with asthma. Uh, a lot of great cardiovascular walking. All those things are just as important as the other side of life, sleep, and programming our internal clocks to just manage that in a really, really good way. Hearing conservation is so, so important. Sometimes I'll walk down the sidewalk and I'll be able to hear what the student in front of me is listening to on their iPods, too loud. So hearing conservation is critical uh, for preservation uh, of our hearing acuity and the ability to manage well. Sometimes teachers 
who are talking to a big classroom can really use amplification devices for their presentations. That's really helpful. We see a lot of actors and um, singers when they are on Broadway shows having this mechanism, this um, small amplification device that's usually put into their wigs or worn on the side. So that microphone is managed by the sound crew and it helps them. But I think also for teachers or coaches and things like that, that would be really something valuable to look in if at the end of the day, you find you just are so hoarse or struggling. And the other thing that might be something to be concerned about, it certainly affects a lot of singers because we tend to eat late at night after a show. It's what we call reflux disease. So what happens is there's a backsplash from maybe not eating enough or not putting meals in too late and then not remaining active. So try to be mindful not to eat too late at night or large meals without activity. And there's lots of things that can trigger reflux disease. So you'll go to the otolaryngologist and they'll be able to scope you and they'll be able to find out possibly, oh, there's some redness here at this cartilage. This might be part of the problem. So there'll be certain uh, symptoms that you can report. So we call an overuse or an abusive kind of syndrome phonotrauma. But my perspective is that an injured voice user should not be shamed for that injury. I don't think anybody's going to come after uh, somebody who wrecked their knee playing football or soccer um, because it sometimes comes with the territory. And sometimes medical conditions or pre existing conditions can lead to vocal challenges. But there are some things that really get in our way. Not taking time to rest, like we said, or not prioritizing warming up before teaching. Talking excessively, talking loudly, or when you're ill or you feel that you have laryngitis, then you start to whisper. But actually what you should do is write on a board, write on a piece of paper, really be quiet. Whispering is, such, is still as detrimental as things like habituated throat clearing <clears throat> out of nervousness, or maybe there's some reflux uh, symptoms that you're dealing with. Sometimes singers sing roles that are a little bit too heavy, repertoire that's a little bit too heavy or in the wrong key. This is where our music teachers come in because as we teach, we really need to be mindful of what especially young developing voices need to grow in that way. So suppose you are one of those teachers and I get here at 9.30 in the morning and I do a lecture class twice a week for an hour and then I'll teach five and six hours straight. So if I'm demonstrating and teaching and rehearsing, those are really big challenges for music teachers during the year, especially people who do their own performing and teaching. Um, we always, I can only imagine how many uh, public school teachers are visiting the throat doctor in January after the Christmas concert and singing in holiday concerts and singing in churches and choirs and things like that and being fatigued at the end of a long year. Our younger singers without really good technique taught by their teachers are absolutely vulnerable, especially in music theater genre, because young singers in music theater often think that they don't need technique, that they can sing on their natural talent. And that would be a really big misstep. So I think it's up to us as teachers to really, really give those musical theater colleagues of ours a lot of really good attention more often than not, young singers drop out of Broadway tours because of the grueling need to sing, I say, you know, eight days a week because they're doing matinees and they're doing things in the evening. Those are some of the ways singers could get into trouble. So when I feel as a professional voice user, maybe you're a trial lawyer. Maybe you just teach uh, and you just do a lot of lecturing. Maybe you go out and do uh, communications work in that way. Where do I go? What do you do? 
So the professionals that support you that are really, really important are the laryngologists or the otolaryngologist, eye, uh, ear, nose, and throat doctors. And they're at voice care centers or medical centers near you. We're so lucky in Rochester to have a voice care center, but a lot of now metropolitan areas do and deal specifically doctors with voice care. It's great. Um, speech pathologists. I started my life as a speech pathologist long ago before I started singing. And I can remember this was, yes, 1978. I've never felt older by saying that date when we had a presentation at my grad school in Columbia University in New York City. And one of the doctors said, someday when we're able to operate on the vocal cords. And I looked at my friends next to me and said, are you kidding? That will never, how could that be? What is that going to happen? Well, we've got it now. Amazing things that our doctors can do and our voice therapists can do to support us. Voice teachers and coaches, very, very important to help us learn our roles and learn things really healthily. Psychologists, maybe there's issues that we have from time to time, crises of confidence, crises with depression, or possibly that there's a lot of drugs that we take valuably for um, ADHD, for depression. Sometimes there are vocal complications that come in, but our psychologists and our psychiatrists are great at looking at the right medication for us and then talking to us about fear that comes in when we want to perform or when we try to do our best, because it's very vulnerable feeling in that way. Physical therapists also really, really important. So when you get your appointment, you're going to say, okay, what information am I going to gather up? and What am I going to take with me? So what you want to do is document your illness. This helps the physician and the speech pathologist who will see you first. So help so much. When did this feeling start? And how long has this feeling, how long have I been challenged by this? And what are my symptoms? Was it preceded by a cold or flu or bronchitis or respiratory infections, maybe allergies that are seasonal in that way? And of course, COVID, because now we're still studying the effects on voice and singing and respiration, long-term COVID effects that come up. But there's other things to consider that you might bring to the doctor's attention. So if you're Zooming, um, think about what happens to your body mass, because as I was Zooming and listening to my students, this is how scary I was. I was up here listening as close as I can. So look what my neck was doing. I wasn't getting this length. I wasn't releasing. Um, and because we're pressing forward, um, if you don't get information on how to manage your voice, or you're not warming the voice up beforehand, you can get into a little bit of trouble. People who work in noisy environments, like say you're the wait staff or restaurant staff, and you're always having to talk in a noisy environment, or you work and at night, let's say at the bar you're working at, uh, serving um, food, and then they have music at night. So you're talking over that. Uh, as we said, having to teach and sing, and maybe you that was happening while you were fighting the cold or you were fighting some allergies. Talk to the doctor about your general health issues, whether there were changes in medication. Are you getting a lack of sleep? Are you eating too late at night, which we talked about reflux disease, which is referred to as GERD or LPR. So when you go to the doctor with all this information, the doctor will scope you and look at the vocal folds for Scott. You see a light attached, this fiber optic, and he can see the mechanism all around. This is also what was so extraordinary for me to see as these opportunities for really great health care. And this is an example of what an otolaryngologist will show. We got computer to be able to see how the vocal folds work and to be looking around the mechanism. And he can see it on a movie or on a photo. And he has the ability to look all around the mechanism and be able to see what you might be struggling with. So how do we keep our voice healthy? How do we make some easy warm-ups before speaking and teaching. 
Well, a student of mine who teaches at VOCO uh, talked to a friend there who's a speech pathologist up in Boston, and they tried to develop, uh, Chandler Thompson was his name, he tried to develop what a warm-up would be for a choir on the bus. Getting on the bus, sitting quietly on the choir uh, tour, and how they go to the next place and how they easily warm up. So some of those things would be humming, mm, an easy low range, releasing the tongue like that. You sort of feel an energy in here that sparks up the energy of position. Find a comfortable pitch mm, and hold it for 10 seconds and then increase by going up. Perhaps things like stretching and stretching the vocal folds, call them lip trills or tongue trills. Sometimes ooh, ooh, just oohs and ahs and easy descending little patterns. And I love this last one to sing aluminum linoleum just to get everything percolating there so your speech and voice therapist will be great at giving you all kinds of possibilities with straw or cups lip trills all these things that your voice therapist will do and have also prepped into singing and warming up our voice for singing there's something that I want to touch on that's a little bit um, frustrating for me because it's really creeping in to people who give presentations online and in person. It's called vocal fry. So yeah, it is kind of sounding like frying. Uh, you speak in a really low register or range of your voice, and this would be an example. There's no support at the end. And really, sometimes it's just really pressed. So it's kind of creaky, kind of breathy. You can see I'm not really supporting. I can barely get to the end of a phrase. It seems to be really creeping in. And when I began to hear it in broadcasting and communications, my radar went up because it's not really harmful to health and voice. But over time, anything habituated can really lead to some problems. So um, I think it impacts our message. After a while, it sort of seems like it's a little blasé. There's a lot of theories how it kind of crept into popular culture in that way. But I think voice therapists and our singing teachers can really help us make better sound a habit through their exercises and vocal warmups and utilizing the muscles in a better way to produce a stronger, more resonant voice. Ease, position, and the breath. So with therapy or voice work, they're going to help you find from here a more optimal position for speaking and help you carry that over into everyday speech. And then truthfully, the chiaroscuro, the beauty of the sound is so much easier to listen to. And then the message becomes so much more important when you have some of these techniques that can get you to the next step. So whether we're using our voices in our vocation, lawyer, doctor, or we're using our voices just for fun, avocationally. Um, I have a couple of students in my vocal pedagogy class who are choral conductors. And I always say, don't you wish everybody that sang in your choir warmed up all week long, except for Wednesday night? And they were laughing because yeah, our days are so busy. But an easy day can really, really start off with just easy kind of work we stretch when we get out of bed. You can sing a little bit in the shower because, well, if you do humming and lip trills and easy slides, you know you always sound better in the shower, right? I have two tenors that are in my house with me, and there's a lot of singing in the shower. But we use our voices for joy, and we use our voices for our professional uh, obligations, and both are equally as important for us.
And so I just wanted to end this PowerPoint itself by these amazing words, because Maya Angelou always finds a way to say something with great strength. Words mean more than what is written down on paper. It takes the human voice to really infuse them with deeper meaning. And I wanna think about that because I think our voices are very personal and very important to us. And we wanna to try to keep them healthy. So this has been kind of a quick primer on what to do, how to help yourself, and more importantly, where to go when you feel you're getting in some local trouble or you would like to have some support. So we may not have any questions, but we might have a question in the chat. So let me just see if I can click that on. Okay, is there any questions? Maybe not. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my email. Into the chat and you can contact me at any time. Also, many of you will know that the University of Rochester and other uh, practices around town have a lot of really great voice uh, doctors that can support us on this journey. And I think that's really, really what's important for us to get questions. Uh, no question is too unimportant. Um, so I would just charge you all uh, till the end to um, make the human voice and make your voice really, really sound as important as your message is. So have a great day and keep drinking water. Thanks so much. <laughs>